Uh, Kane uh, from Virginia. Funny story that, about that, Mr. Chair. That this happens to us a lot. That's my um, accent. I'm sorry. I, I, this is such an important hearing, and I'm really glad we're having it. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. I have a lot more than I'd like to say. Or I have a lot more than five minutes, so I'm going to try to be quick. Um, the Army survey. I think the thing that interests me about this survey, and and it would probably have some applicability to the other branches as well, is the. The chief barrier cited, and there's no close second really, the, the chief barrier cited by 21% and the next one is 13% is, I'd be putting the rest of my life on hold. So that, the psychology of that statement is, is important, I think, to understand. It suggests, and, and probably this in an all-volunteer military where so, so few people have the connection to military life, People look at military services, oh, that's something where, you know, I go and do this thing, and maybe it's good for the country, but I put the rest of my life on hold. And they don't connect military service with, this is a building block for the rest of my life. I mean, people who serve in the military gain all these skills. My employers are all the time are telling me, I can train for the technical skill, but what I don't have, what I can't train for is an attitude of teamwork, flexibility, stay till the job's done, mission focus, help somebody out. Those skills I can't train for and I can't find them. And this is what our service members have and also what our military spouses tend to have. Um, but, but that answer, I'm, I'm not going to serve in the Army because I'd be putting the rest of my life on hold, suggests that the story that we need to tell about military service is that it's a building block to the rest of your life rather than a timeout for you know two, four, or eight years. And so I wonder as you're thinking about you know, telling the story and recruiting, how, how do you intend to get at that chief barrier? Maybe start with Secretary Camarillo. Thank you, Senator Kane. You, you, are, you said it perfectly. So uh, what our takeaway was from that survey result was that first and foremost, people in that younger population set don't understand the possibilities and career potential that they get from military service. That tells us we need to reintroduce ourselves, as I said earlier, to the American public as a career destination of choice that creates and expands opportunities for our young people, no matter whether they stay in military service long term or they go off and take on different careers. So that was part of our approach to not only advertise and highlight the different career choices you have in the Army. If you want to come in and be a cyber specialist, if you want to be a veterinarian, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, you can do almost literally any career choice within the Army for a set period of time. Come do it as part of national service, and we will give you the training. We'll help you achieve your career uh, aspirations. We'll even fund some of your higher education, college and grad school in some cases. That is the message we're starting to tell, and that is how we're trying to reinforce that people can be all you can be in the Army. Secretary Raven, then Secretary Jones. Uh, Senator Kane, you hit it exactly on the, uh, the nail, exactly on the head. And let me just tell a story about what it might mean for, for one, uh, some young Americans. Uh, highly qualified Americans coming out of high school have an opportunity to join the Navy, and if they meet the highest standards we have, they can go to nuclear power school. They can serve on a submarine. They can serve on an air craft carrier doing incredible things. And if they like uh, what we offer, they can stay in service and have uh, substantial uh, bonuses and, uh, and opportunities to go to college. Uh, it's a great career. If they choose to move on, they will be in demand for the skills that we provide them. So that's what it means uh, in, in real terms for Americans who might be considering this, uh, this field. And Secretary Jones, before you answer, I was intrigued by your comments in your testimony that you're doing really well at attracting folks to Space Force. So to me, that suggests people look at that. Well, that's cool, and that's probably connected to like careers that are kind of aerospace careers. So people might see the connection between that and later and not think it's just time out of their life, but talk about how the Air Force is trying to grapple with this this barrier. Yes, Senator. The uh, Space Force has an overwhelming number of recruits. It is a much smaller number we have to attract, but many people who aren't interested otherwise in serving in the military are interested in the Space Force. Um, to the points that were made by uh, Chairman Reed earlier, we do have a situation where we have a, a family affair, so to speak, where, where families, including my own, have a history of military service, where certain parts of the country, regional uh, areas, have more military service. So we need to expand our aperture in terms of who we are talking to about the value of military service. One point that I'll make, often folks think that military service is something to do instead of education, and that is certainly right. not true in the Department of the Air Force. 
Our, our current force has earned 160,000 degrees from associates to PhDs since coming hmm. into the service. And so we want to get that message out to uh, people who aren't aware of the outstanding educational opportunities, as well as high-tech careers, as my colleagues have mentioned. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chair.